world that there are these four stages of the embryological cycle that only somebody today with a microscope could have known about. How could a uh, prophet uh, or someone with no scientific knowledge, he could even read and write, how could he have known something that specific, that particular, in the seventh century. Do you have an answer for that? Yeah, I mean, if, if you read the Quran and you read Sur al Munimun, which is the 23rd chapter of the Quran, verses 12 to 14, and we read, we created. Let's do that again. Oh, chapter 23, verse 12 to 14, is where it is first listed. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, and, and we read there, we created man from nectar of clay. Then we made him as a drop in a place of settlement firmly fixed. Nectar out of clay, drop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we made the drop into an alaka. Then we made the alaka into a, a mukka, which means chewed substance. Okay. Um, and so the, um, the word alaka can mean leech, it can mean suspended thing, or it can mean blood clot. And so basically, um, what Muslims have argued is they typically make these drawings of the embryo looking somewhat like a leech or something like that. There's a popular Islamic um, apologetics book called an Il A Brief Illustrated Guide to Understanding Islam, and they have a a, a leech um, which is um, compared with the human embryo. I think the drawings are highly exaggerated. I don't think it really looks like that. Professor Keith Moore is one of the world's prominent scientists in the fields of anatomy and embryology and is the author of the book entitled The Developing Human, which has been translated into eight languages. The book is considered a scientific reference work and was chosen by the Special Committee in the United States as the best book authorized by one person. Dr. Keith Moore is the Professor of Anatomy and Cell Biology at the University of Toronto in Toronto, Canada. In 1984, he received the most distinguished award presented in the field of anatomy in Canada, the JCB Grant Award from the Canadian Association of Anatomists. He has directed many international associations such as the Canadian and American Association of Anatomists and the Council of the Union of Biological Sciences. Let's now listen to what Professor Keith Moore has to say. This is the Alaka stage. The, this uh, second or shaping stage begins as the Alaka, which is an Arabic word meaning a leech. And when I was first asked about this, did the human embryo look like a leech? And when I thought about this for a few minutes, I realized that it uh, resembled the leech very closely, as you will uh, see. During the early stage, the embryo loses its rounded shape and elongates and until it takes the shape of a leech. And this uh, picture here, I uh, went over to our library and got out a book on leeches and uh, had my artist draw that exactly from the textbook showing a leech. And here is a, a human embryo uh, here, uh, and they're on the 21, 22 days. And I think you have to agree that they look very much alike. In fact, you see that the leech has segments, just like a worm, and the human embryo has, uh, has the, these same segments. In fact, we still have a remnant of those segments in our bodies. If any of you have ever had shingles, ever heard of anyone having shingles, you always get the eruptions and, and bands across the area that's infected. And those bands are the remnants of those uh, segments. So this is uh, what I believe to be the, the leech-like appearance of the human embryo. Uh, the, uh, and, I, and I believe in my descriptions in my book, I talk about it having a leech-like appearance. The similarity between the, the embryo and a leech is amazing. The embryo is attached to the wall of the uh, chorion, chorionic sac, which is attached by chorionic villi to the endometrium or lining of the uterus. Uh, and so the human embryo is attached to the lining of the uterus, just like a leech will attach to your skin. I don't know whether you have leeches here or not, but we have certain lakes in Canada. If you go in swimming, these leeches will attach to your skin and suck the blood. So the analogy there is, is quite uh, uh, amazing. Uh, initially, the embryo acquires a primitive circulatory and nervous system during this early stage. That's the term alica. It refers to the leech-like external appearance of the embryo as, a well as, as well as to its clinging relationship to the uterus and is an appropriately descriptive term for this stage. In, uh, they also show a piece of chewed gum 
um, with tooth marks that resemble somites um, and that the embryo will be a pharyngula stage embryo and um, they, they will try to show a resemblance there but really it's just the, the chewed gum has been manipulated to look like the, the human embryo when really there is no resemblance at all. It's really clutching its straws I, I think to make that type of argument. And again, when I was asked what this meant, it says, uh, I, it reminded me of an embryo at this stage. And uh, when I was told that the mudka meant a chewed substance, I thought of a, the embryo here. You see these little bead-like structures, which we call somites. They are beginning of what will be the vertebrae or the backbone. And uh, I suggested that this chewed stage uh, could be uh, re refer referring to these uh, uh, somites which have the appearance of, uh, of a chewed substance. If you take, as I did at that time, took a piece of gum and, and bit into it and you're left with these teeth marks which look very much uh, like this. So uh, this stage, the mudga stage, occurs at about 26 to 27 days and we call that the somite period in uh, descriptive embryology. Uh, the transformation from the alica to the mudga is very rapid, and during the last day or two of the alica stage, the embryo is beginning to develop some of the characteristics of the mudga, that is, the somites begin to appear. The word mudga means a piece of substance which has been chewed, and uh, as used to describe this next phase of embryonic development, it uh, should apply uh, with the shape of a substance that the teeth have chewed. In fact, the appropriateness of this term mudka has been indicated in modern embryology. It has been termed that after the formation of the embryo and the placenta, this stage, the embryo receives its nutrients and energy, thereby rapidly increasing the growth process. The bodily masses, called somites, from which the bones and the muscle will form, start to appear. During the multitude of bead-like structures, or, or somites, that are present, the embryo has the appearance of a substance that had been, had been imprinted by teeth. The processes of this period can be recognized in the following points. First, the appearance of the somites or the imprints changes constantly. And just as the teeth imprints change on a substance with each act of chewing, the embryo changes its overall shape, but the structure derived from the somites remain. And secondly, the embryo turns in its position due to the modifications in its uh, center of gravity with the new tissue formation, similar to the turning of a substance with chewing. And third, just as a chewed substance becomes curled before being swallowed, so does the back of the embryo become curved. And four, as the somites form, the internal features of the embryo in the mudga stage are partly differentiated into organ onlaga, that means the beginning of structures, and partly undifferentiated. And this uh, description is also uh, stated in the Quran. Now, this is an, a later stage of mudga. You can see the uh, tail that we all had at that stage. And this little uh, flipper-like structure is what's going to be your, your upper limb. Uh, and so uh, th this is the uh, mudga stage. <laughs> ask you how big are, 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 are when we're talking about the alaka stage mm. that's the second stage mm. the first stage is the zygote stage mm. now that you cannot observe with the human eye well no the the pharyngula stage is like the mid stage of, this is this is speaking about vertebrate embryos in particular and um, the pharyngula stage is this highly conserved phylotypic stage um, which um, is which uh, at which um, vertebrate embryos are more similar than they are is that earlier stages to the naked eye uh, no when a woman has a miscarriage. No. You cannot, so, so it is too small for the naked eye to Correct. see that state. So they would have a pretty good argument if someone in the seventh century can observe something that's not vi visible to the naked eye. How did he know, even whether or not it is using gum or any other um, object, how would he have known that, that, that particular that early? Where do you think that they got that embryological cycle from? They meaning the ones who wrote the Quran. I don't know. <laughs> Let me give you a hint. How about Galen? Do you know Galen? I, I'm not familiar with that. Galen is actually an embryologist uh, mm -hmm. who is a Jewish embryologist mm -hmm. writing in the second century. He talks about the exact same four stages that you just read about mm -hmm. in Surah 23. Mm -hmm. 
the zygote stage followed by the alaka stage. He doesn't use the word alaka. He says Jew mass. Mm -hmm. Alaka is the Arabic for that description. Right. Followed by the bone stage, followed by the flesh stage. The exact same four stages you find in the Quran are found in Galen's writing from the second century used in Stesiphon. It was well known that this is the what was taught in what is today Baghdad. Stesiphon is the mm -hmm. archaic name. <laughs> now, you're not an embryologist, but you're a cell biologist. Uh -huh. You know that whether or not it was zygote going up to the alaka, going up to the bones, going up to the meat. Do the bones form before the flesh? No, they don't. <laughs> they form simultaneously, yeah. don't they? Yeah. So even Galen made a mistake. <laughs> that mistake is incorporated into the Quran. Yeah, exactly. Modern scientists just know that, and uh -huh. they say, hold on a minute, we don't use Galen anymore because of that mistake. Why did the Quran use that? Well, obviously because they were borrowing. And when you borrow, you don't really think through, or you don't even know whether or not this is a mistake. We now know it's a mistake today. Islam stage, this subsequent stage uh, phase of development is referred to as Islam, which means bones. And the fetus does indeed acquire a, a cartilaginous skeleton after the mudga stage. Those of you that have studied embryology realize that first of all you have what we call mesenchymal bones made out of connective tissue, then they become cartilaginous, and then they become uh, ossified and become uh, bones, solid bones. The formation of the bone does not begin uniformly throughout the body. Rather, there is a sequen sequential appearance of bony tissue. In recent decades, the process of osteogenesis in the human embryo has been reasonably well documented. Bone development in the limb, limbs commences in the embryonic limb buds from these mesenchymal or connective tissue cells. Primary ossification centers appear in the femur during the fifth week, the femur is your thigh bone, uh, and in the sternum, it's breastbone, and the maxilla, jaw, during eight to nine weeks. The timing of the exam phase has been mentioned in the following hadith. You simply show these various stages when, at this stage, the bones in the limb would be cartilaginous. The same here, you're starting to get little uh, indications of the uh, bones uh, developing. And then this hadith says, when 42 nights have passed from the time of the nutva, that is the time of conception, Allah sends an angel to it who shapes it and makes its ears, eyes, skin, muscles, and bones. In the early phase, part of this phase, the embryo takes on a human appearance, Tazwir Adami, and the Hadith describes this with the word shapes. Before the 42nd day, it is difficult to, to distinguish the human embryo from the embryos of many animals. But at this stage, it becomes clearly distinguishable in its appearance. Uh, I couldn't tell a mouse embryo from a human embryo or a rabbit embryo in those very early stages. So as this hadith is making clear is that after this uh, 40th day, when uh, the angel uh, sends an angel to it, which shapes it and so on, that it takes on its human characteristics. Accompanying this development is a straightening of the embryo described by the word sawa. During this period, the embryo becomes more erect and acquires a more evenly rounded body. Some of the generalized cells of the embryo begin to differentiate into various lines and modify into different functional moieties. This process results in straightening and the formation of organs necessary for viability. As the Quran describes, when God created you, then, and the word fa means then, made you even and straight, sawak. And then fa, again, modified you, adalak, and uh, so on. According to uh, the table, and is that on the slide, the table? Showing the different stages. Here's, here's the table which you're referring to. You can see these stages listed the uh, along the side here, and uh, you have the shaping stage, and, and so on. These are all correlated with the age and days, and the uh, actual size of the uh, embryo. 
According to this uh, table, which compares the three ayat on the stages of development, it is apparent that the Islam stage corresponds with the straightening stage, Taswiya. The word Sawak in the Quranic statement indicates the following. First, to straighten the position of the body from a bent position, and to also to make uneven things leveled. The embryo at the seventh week has a bent back, thus taking the shape of the letter C during the mudga stage. In the Izam stage, the bending position is straightened and the surface becomes more even due to the disappearance of prominences and depressions. Now the Lam stage, although precursor cells, which we call myoblasts or early muscle cells, are present adjacent to the developing bones, differentiation into skeletal muscle attachments appears after the ossification process in the shaft and the ends of the bones. I was asked many times, did the bones bef appear before the muscles? Well, they certainly do. If you want to be logical about it, you wouldn't have muscles until you had something to attach them to. So you have bones and then the muscles. And this is clearly uh, stated in the Quran that the bones appear first. A major developmental landmark during the eighth week is the LAM stage, which describes the myogenesis, that is the formation of muscles. Uh, which marks the development of the definitive muscles in the trunk and the limbs and the beginning of movement. The muscles take their position around the bones, that is, clothing the bones, and continue the process of straightening and smoothing, taswiya. In other words, as the muscles develop, they straighten the embryo up, which uh, the straightening and smoothing which began in the Izam stage. It is now known that the gonads, that is, the developing sex glands, differentiate into testes and ovaries at this time, that is, during the eighth week. And the Quran refers to this development as well. But where did Galen get this from? How did he know about the zygote? How did he know about the chewed mass? Since he didn't have microscopes even in the second century. Ooh, I love this. Yeah. But it even goes further back than that. Because <laughs> we also know that the Greeks knew about the different stages. We have Aristotle talking about 15 stages of the embryo. How did Aristotle know this? <laughs> he was writing in the third, I'm sorry, the fourth century BC. Ooh, I love this. So there's nothing new under the sun. This has all been borrowed from other sources. The first uh, scientific studies in embryology, as far as we know, were uh, done by the uh, Greek uh, scientists in the fifth century BC. Uh, Hippocrates, who we know as the father of medicine, and uh, after whom the Hippocratic Oath is named, uh, was one of the first to write books on embryology. And later Aristotle, another famous Greek philosopher and scientist, studied chick embryos, actually opened eggs and was able to study the uh, development. Concluded at that time, and this is uh, 4th and 5th century BC that man's development, that is human development, was similar to that of the chicken. The writings of Aristotle and Galen, another uh, scientist, dominate the early part of, the, of our historical record. And from the time of G Galen, around 200 AD, until the 16th century, no major advances in our knowledge of embryology were recorded in the literature of Western science. This is mainly because these kind of studies were forbidden in those very dark ages. Consequently, as far as we know, until the revelations in the Quran, man was relatively ignorant about his reproduction and development. It was not until the invention of the microscope in the 17th century that any significantly new information was added to the field of embryology. Uh, before this uh, time, the fetus was said to develop from a coagulum of human uh, blood and, and the seed. There's really no idea of how we developed, but in the days of Aristotle, they believed, as uh, Sheikh uh, Mustafa Ahmed said, that menstrual blood was the uh, thought to give rise to the embryo and that the, uh, they really didn't know anything about uh, spermatozoa or sperms. But when the uh, microscope was uh, discovered, if we could have that first uh, slide. Now these early microscopes were very primitive by uh, our standards today. 
Uh, this first slide, I don't know whether they're going to, can you see those? Well, that, that's a picture of Aristotle there, uh, uh, one of the earliest uh, writers in, in human embryology. Maybe with the microscope we could come on. Yeah, this is the uh, microscope that was invented uh, by Leeuwenhoek uh, in 1694. And this is a very uh, crude microscope. As you can see, the object, whatever it was you were looking at, was put on the end of a needle point and uh, there was a small magnifying glass, and you would look at this, but uh, it didn't give very uh, uh, much magnification. It'd be equivalent to what you would get now if you used a magnifying glass. So it wouldn't give very much uh, enlargement. So this is the, the state of, of uh, knowledge uh, in uh, the 17th century, and uh, it would not be possible for them to uh, see the uh, early stages of human development, even at that uh, time. Now, uh, when they did see what they thought was a sperm, uh, they thought that this uh, sperm, and if we could just have, they, they visualized this sperm with a little imagination that inside that sperm or male germ cell was a little human being. And all it needed was for it to be implanted in the female and in the environment of the mother's uterus, this would stimulate this little person to start uh, developing. And so the real role of the uh, female then was to give this uh, little embryo a place to develop and to stimulate it. Now I should say in fairness, there are others who believe uh, that uh, the female ovary, the oocytes or eggs, they contained the little human being. So there was two groups. One said the little human being was in a sperm, Others said it was in the oocyte or egg, and that, that when they uh, started to develop, then this little person just got bigger. So that shows you what our knowledge was like in uh, the 17th century. The fact that the sperm and the ovum were necessary for conception was not known until the 18th century, uh, when there were further refinement, refinements in our optical uh, instruments and microscopes were better developed and so on and so they were actually able to see the uh, sperm and the egg and realize then uh, that they actually came together in a process which was called uh, fertilization. Now later in the development in embryology uh, they developed the idea of stages uh, and the first attempts to arrange human embryos in stages were made towards the end of the 19th century. And these efforts continued during the early part of the 20th century. In 1914, uh, Dr. Moll, in this country, arranged 266 human embryos in a series of stages. 28 years later, Dr. Streeter, also of the United States, classified human embryos in 23 stages, which he called developmental horizons. Now, Streeter's classifications were used worldwide until 1973, when Dr. Uh, Ronan O'Reilly, who's at uh, University of San Diego, developed a more detailed system for classifying human embryos, particularly during the first three weeks of development. Now these Carnegie stages, that is named after the Carnegie Institute of Embryology, uh, have received international approval and are based on very various uh, developmental events and morphological criteria. And these uh, timetables of human development are from my book, which I developed uh, in uh, about 1970, uh, based on the uh, Carnegie stages of human development. And uh, at this time, when I did these uh, stages, I had no uh, awareness that there was anything about human development in the uh, Koran. So uh, it's only then in the last... Uh, uh, 15 to 20 years that we've had a good knowledge of the stages of human development. Now this development or knowledge has increased rapidly in the last few years. Now a major difficulty in the classification of terminology is the fact that the shape of the embryo is continuously changing. The principles for nomenclature and for uh, terminology for descriptive embryology are the terms that are applied to a particular development which would be descriptive of what the embryo really looks like. There should also be full agreement between the term 
uh, and the nature of the development and events occurring at that stage. In order to avoid confusion, each term should define a stage which has a clear beginning and an end as is possible in order to avoid any overlap between stages or on the other hand to avoid any gaps between one stage and another. Now, uh, it was about this time that I began to study the uh, Quran and to look at verses referring to embryology. So I found that there was a, a, a large uh, terminology in the Quran referring to human development. Now, uh, as they, until uh, recently, it was not known that this holy book of the Muslims uh, and the Sunnah, or Hadith, the teachings of Muhammad, contain many citations referring to the stages of human development. Until recently, these statements were not clearly understood, since they referred to details in development which were not scientifically, which were scientifically unknown in earlier times. In fact, the Islamic system for classifying human embryos is amazingly, uh, is amazing, since it was recorded in the seventh century A.D. Although Aristotle, as I mentioned before, the founder of the science of embryology, realized that chick embryos developed in stages from uh, uh, hen's eggs in the fourth century, he did not give any details about these stages. Also, the early human embryo is of such a minute size that uh, detailed studies would have been impossible without the microscope. Uh, in the very early stages of human development, the first few days, uh, it's so small that you could just barely see it. Uh, in other words, it's about the size of a period at the end of a sentence. And you could realize how, without our modern microscopes, you would not be able to see any of those details of the early stages. Now, as far as we know from the history, history of embryology, little was known about the staging and classification of human embryos until the last hundred years. As, as I've just mentioned. Moreover, the Quranic terminology fulfills the principles for nomenclature and terminology. For this reason, the descriptions of human embryos in the Quran cannot be based on scientific knowledge in the seventh century. The only reasonable conclusion that is that these descriptions were revealed to Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, by God. He could not have known such details because he was an illiterate man. He was not a scientist or an embryology and he did not have scientific training. Like, share, and subscribe to create awareness. We are also available on Facebook, Google+, Twitter, and PalTalk.